What's up, everyone? Hey, man. Bye, Scotty. Howdy, howdy. Well, I'm excited. We got a guest today who many of you know. So some questions prompted over the last week um, with regards to investment properties and the furlough. Um, is it lifted or not? Can we um, occupy a home and put our clients in it? If it's currently tenant occupied, what do the rules look like on that? So I had Bruce Mankey. I was trying to get him in here um, as well, but just kind of last minute. Um, so Bruce won't be joining us, but Josue will be joining us and kind of giving some color. Josue is a property manager. Many of you know him from La Mirada, um, who will kind of who will share his take on what's possible on um, tenants' rights, et cetera. And then uh, we wanted to go over a piece of technology too, just some questions that are coming up um, for many of you now that we're starting coaching. Um, it's great because you guys are poking holes in either the system or you're having questions about uh, a system that I know will benefit many of others on this call. So we'll kind of dive into those nuggets as well. Um, we have any first timers on, on uh, the circle right now? That have any that want to do any introductions? Okay. All right. Well, uh, I see Josue just logged in before we jump into it, then see if there's anyone else that's going to join us in a second. Uh, Alex, appreciate you coming on here, kind of just guiding us on what's happening in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. Where are rates? What are you seeing? Are we still starting off slow like January? Yeah, same, shot in the arm. yeah, same thing as, you know, last few weeks, I, like I've discussed, you know, rates are still slowly creeping up, um, you know, business has a slowed down, I want to say, for everybody here in the office, and uh, like I mentioned last week, I feel like a lot of these clients, we're getting a lot of applications here coming in, right, but not that many deals are opening and I feel like it's due to the fact that a lot of people are hearing about these rates going up and they have that fear of missing out. So I'm also seeing a lot more off. We've been seeing offer a lot of offers per house and it kind of mellowed down a little bit, but it was still a lot of offers. But, you know, out in the Inland Empire, I have a few agents out there. Uh, we're still seeing 30 plus offers out there. And, you know, the bidding just keeps climbing up and up and up. Yeah. Okay. It, it, it's, I feel like a lot of people are just trying to rush in, get into a property before these rates shoot up, you know, according to what the Federal Reserve is, the first potential hike should be here in the next few weeks. Any uh, expectations of where, of what they're no, talking about? They, they, they were initially saying fours, you know, we, we already seen fours for like uh, condos with low down payments. Um, but I want to say probably about four to four and a half uh, for just, you know, across the board with all different types of loan types. FHA still remains, you know, mid threes, which is still moderate. Uh, mm -hmm. Conventional high threes, depending on the scenario. And then condos conventional uh, with a minimum down payment are, you know, four, four and an eighth, give or take as of today. Got it. Okay. Okay. With that being said, um, who, who on the call has either a new piece of business, whether it's a buyer or a listing that you're um, got under contract, whether it's hit the market or it's about to hit the market in the last week? Is, in, is there any activity from us going on out there? New, new, um, new listing in North Long Beach, uh, 3-1. Uh, 1500 square foot, three one with the den corner lot, huge backyard. Um, uh, over in North Long Beach, we're gonna list that 649 and then just kind of see where it goes from there. I think I talked about it last week in the last week, though. That's it. When you when's that hitting the market? It, it just hit, we just went live today, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and phone's going crazy. Oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah. Okay. Any, so one any, of my, yeah. So one of my listings is going to go on the market uh, tomorrow. Uh, 
Um, it is a three bedroom, one bath downstairs with two bedrooms, one bath upstairs, kitchen. Um, it's almost like two separate units, pool property. It's um, address is 3068 Palo Verde. It's going to be listed at about 1.1. Wow. Very nice. Long Beach? Yeah, it's in Long Beach. I'm sorry. No. How about any buyers? Anyone having luck on buyers? Or let me ask you this. Anyone writing offers with buyers? Or are they not even submit an offer right now? You are. I've been seeing a lot of rejections recently, you know, working with a few agents and buyers. Uh, it's just they're getting slaughtered out there, even though we're being competitive with short time frames and contingencies and whatnot. Um, it's still not suffice to get our offer accepted. You know, I had a, I had an agent who submitted an offer. Our property was started at 425 where there was a suicide six months ago. Uh, the winning offer went up at 490 and this is in Moreno Valley. Wow. So it, it's yeah. still extremely competitive out there. A lot of rejections, unfortunately, but it's just a matter of keeping our buyers motivated and getting, you know, getting them out there to submit offers. Yeah. That's the big question, how to, how to keep them motivated. Cause you know, I know I talk about this with uh, many of our agents uh, staying optimistic, being the light for our clients, because I know you guys are feeling beat up and tired and dragged around. And um, you know, we, we kind of have this rule of thumb, like the game we play is we have three opportunities to get them into escrow before they decide to change directions, which means they're going to, you know, the grass is greener with another agent typically. And so um, it's trying to keep them optimistic and, and uh, just sharing stories of who are we getting into escrow? Like if anyone on this call is getting people into escrow, it's really about what did you have to do in order to get that acceptance? And that's the story that we share with the next prospect, the next client to see how they feel about that. You know, again, I'm going to assume we're removing a lot of our rights and we're substantially over list price and not many are willing to do that. And it's really quickly shuffling through to figure out who's willing to play uh, to win and versus who's just kind of still not too sure whether or not home ownership is for them. And those are the ones we got to move on. Unless you're like Danny and you get them a buyer broker agreement then they're, then you always got them. So, but Okay. Well, um, again, I really believe uh, it's going to continue down this path for the next 45, 60 days. This is it. You guys are feeling it. You're hearing it. Uh, I spoke to Hugo Gonzalez. He said a lot of LOs are dropping out. There is no more refis to be had. So a lot of those shops are closing up, letting go of a lot of LOs. Uh, you know, until the feds raise the rates, I think this is what we're at you know, sellers are kind of frozen, buyers are kind of frozen. And the, the challenge is, is making a living right now. And uh, I really believe agents who got into the industry within the last 24 months are going to quickly start applying for jobs because there is no, there, there is no business to be had. Again, year over year in January, it was down almost 25%. That's a lot because last year was pretty quiet too. So again, I'm not trying to scare you guys. You know, I, I know I talked to Dennis yesterday and he's like, dude, you're kind of freaking me out, but you know, I, it, that's just the reality. Right. So that's why we're in a group of individuals like here on this, in, in this zoom with us. I mean, you got a lot of experience here. We, many of us have been through the, not many cycles, but a few cycles. And I can tell you, there are always opportunities in any market. It's just the way we see it. You know what, can I add something, Scott? I think, yeah. um, you know, I was in the, I got in real estate in 2002. So I was in that upswing and then I dealt with 2007 and all that bad drop. Um, but I think this is the opportunity for us to really hone in on skills. I like this market we're heading into because when I first got in the market in real estate in 2002, 2003, it's, I didn't know any better. So I would get listings and I thought I was just an amazing salesperson because it sold in three, four days. But when the market shifted 
that's when you realize, okay, maybe I, I'm not that great. And it gives you the opportunity to improve your skills. It weeds out a lot of the people that just jumped in and they think they're great because everything sells. Um, but I like this market and I think we can all thrive because of our support system here. And we really have to make an effort to improve our skills, negotiation skills, learning how to close and use these systems. Yeah. And I think a, a piece on that, that you alluded to, um, that I just want to highlight is skills. Many, we have not seen a market where we have had to ask for an extension on a listing agreement. That's still, I believe down the road, but those are going to be interesting conversations. It's another negotiation. I mean, as hard as it, hard as it is to negotiate, to get the listing. And if it doesn't sell, you know, it's getting those extensions on those listings. And that's where you're going to see the skill set that's going to separate the strong from the weak, which then Mike Ferry advocates will have a field day with all the expired listings because that's what they're, they're groomed for. So just one similar topic on that. Um, I see some chats popping up. Um, Not oh. oh, okay. Just um, ADD kicking in. <laughs> yeah, the, the number of price uh, reductions has also tumbled. And there's actually been a few price increases. Yeah. No. Um, okay. Well, just kind of wanted to set that up. So again, the market is very challenging. Stay optimistic. Continue to focus on what you can and not worry about the things that are out of reach. So... Um, but with that being said, you know, again, we had some great questions. Um, I don't see Stacy on the call, but, you know, we wanted to get clarity on um, what does it look like um, to purchase a property that is currently tenant occupied and to add different dynamics, section eight could be a client, you know, or a tenant. What does that look like? The furlough, the mandate has been lifted, hasn't been lifted statewide's lifted, but maybe not LA County. So there's a lot of kind of like the mask is the mask is, do we need to wear it? Do we not need to wear it? It's just, there's just a lot of interpretations on it. And uh, while I was trying to get an attorney on here, no slouch uh, to Josue, our guest, but he's pretty diverse. Many of you know Josue uh, from our Keller Williams family, um, who is my resource and my guidance for all tenant, um, landlord questions and or I am not a property manager so I will send my clients to Josue who will manage it for me and for my clients so he's a great outlet for you guys they they oversee probably and he'll he can add to this but around 200 probably more doors perhaps um so I want to just thank Josue great to see you on on the circle man it's probably been a couple of years since we've been on zoom together but thank you for last minute jumping on here, shedding some light and some clarity, and hopefully you can capture some business through this group moving forward as well. Um, but uh, without further ado, you guys know Josue, and let's you know give him a warm welcome and then figure out what questions he can answer for us. Great. No, it's it's really great to see you guys. I haven't well, I mean, we're still not in person, but um, it does feel like a little reunion here. So. Um, I see what you guys are doing, and I love I love just the dynamic of what you guys are building there. It's it's very impressive, and so I love I love to see you guys succeed. Um, and I mean, as far as like, there is a lot of it is very dynamic on on our end. And every time I get a question, I always refer. I, we have a we one of the decisions we made was to get an attorney on retainer because every single day I had a different question and every single day, it seems like the laws are changing for, you know, what was happening in the, in the, in the rental world. Um, so I actually, I, I put together and I, and I do go to different offices and put together a presentation. It usually takes me about an hour to go through it. But what I realized is that there's like three questions that I, I generally get calls for. Um, and so I put together like a, a, sh a short little uh, presentation on that. Is there a way, can I share that with you guys or? You're good, yep. Okay, okay, cool. All right. So let me see, you guys are able to see that, right? Yeah, yep. Okay, so yeah, so basically there's a few questions that I essentially get from, from the realtor community. 
And if this doesn't answer your question, then you know you guys have my contact information, or I, I, I'd be happy to share this information with you guys as well. But it is it is a changing world, and I wish it was changing to the benefit of property owners. But because of the restrictions and because of everything that's kind of going on, uh, most of those laws. Um, benefit the tenants. They don't necessarily benefit the, the people that own the properties or that, you know, saved up money to, to buy those investments. Uh, but essentially, just to kind of get right to it, these are the, the main questions that I get. So how much can I raise the rent? Uh, can I evict? And can I enter a property with, with you know, with the 24-hour notice? So I'll go through the stuff. And if there's questions, feel free to jump in, um, you know, uh, but I think this is kind of some of the main stuff that we kind of go through. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time, but I do want to kind of go through the, the framework of how a lot of this stuff happened. And so this, this law actually, it took effect, it, it passed in March of 2019, it took effect uh, January 1st of 2020. So right as COVID was kind of starting to roll out, this law basically did two different things. It put restrictions on how much we could raise rent. Uh, and then the second part is it really changed the game on evictions. Before this law, you could give and you could give either a, you can give a notice, either a 60 or a 30 day notice, depending on how long the tenants were there uh, for no reason. If you just if they look at you, looked at you wrong or whatever it was, you didn't need a reason to give uh, a notice that you were not gonna continue uh, tenancy with them. This changed the game and it basically only allowed uh, a certain amount of reasons where you could evict a tenant. The main parts being, you know, if they, they're breaking the law, if they're not uh, uh, paying the rent or if they have unauthorized occupants or the whole thing. Uh, it did allow for what was called no fault uh, evic evictions. And essentially, um, those are mainly owner occupancy. If an owner wanted to move back into their unit, or if they were going to, um, you know, do a substantial amount of remodeling, um, and then, um, you know, uh, that 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 did allow for that. You did have to pay a certain amount of relocation, but it wasn't a big deal because it usually kind of you could roll that into the unpaid rent. Um, uh, with that, there was certain exceptions condos, single families, townhouses, and duplexes if the owner lived in one of those. Are you guys with me so far or did I lose everyone there? Okay, cool. So um, that is a very complex law, but essentially kind of did, you know, it, it set the stage for everything that was going on. That was for residential properties, not for commercial properties. Now, so, well, actually, let me go back to that. So in regards to that, so one of the key things that we did uh, in, in that was in the raising of the rents. So a lot of times I'll get a call and people ask, well, how much can I raise the rent? And essentially for the most part, um, it's gonna be 5% plus inflation. And that's calculated every April. So that's gonna be coming up fairly soon. This year, inflation is 3.6. So if we add the five put the plus the 3.6, what do we get? We get 8.6. So you are able to raise the rent a total of 8.6% uh, on most properties. Keep in mind, city of LA is doing its own thing. Unincorporated LA is doing its own thing. Um, and that they have their own rules. And actually, those are both completely frozen right now. So those are not 8.6. Those are zero. So if you have a property in city of LA, it's zero and then there's the unincorporated areas like uh florence firestone walnut park uh, certain, certain parts of compton certain parts of, of whittier those are zero also which really sucks wow um, yeah and that'll be the case for at least for the immediate future um so the other question i get is can we evict <laughs> and so this is kind of the template of what i follow every time someone allows me or calls and say hey can i evict and so i, I am not an attorney I, I run a management company but essentially i can share with this with you guys this was actually provided by the company that we use as well uh i know scott probably does not want you guys doing management or giving any kind of legal advice I would refer them to an eviction attorney or to CAR if they if you guys do have questions like this. But essentially, this is kind of what I'm using uh, whenever there is a question regarding increases or evictions. Uh, and so the big one I get is, can I evict 
well, if there's a breach in the contract. And you'll see that under most circumstances you can. Some cities do not let you, even, even if they have 20 people living there, even if they have unauthorized dogs, even if they have all sorts of crazy stuff. I have a tenant in Long Beach. He just he broke all the windows of the home. And there's not a whole like not not a whole lot I can do. He also hasn't paid a penny of rent since March 1st of 2020, and it's a it's a difficult situation for a lot of property owners, especially some of the ones that own some of these smaller uh, smaller units. Luckily, that's a builder unit, a bigger uh, bigger complex, so there is you know some 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 cushion. But uh, on those situations, they kind of suck when there's like one or two units. Um, uh, so so unless, even in that yeah. scenario, they can't, you, you guys are stuck with the bill to repair, refix. They haven't paid rent, but they're still protected by this mandate. Yeah. And that's what really rubs some salt into the wound is we have to go in there and we have to repair the windows now. And that person needs to get paid. You know, the repair person needs to get paid. So we need to pay them and then bill the tenant. But you know, if they haven't paid a penny of rent since March 1st, 2020, it's obviously a little difficult to be able to try to get that money. Um, it, it has been in the eviction process, but there is a, a, a group that is pretty ferocious on the tenant on the tenant side. Uh, and so they've challenged everything. And we've actually had two of our evictions thrown out on minor technicalities that happened before we started managing the property, uh, which sucks but um um that for us is the exception i think you know we do have we have 250 units right now that we manage and uh there's probably three or four that are problematic the other 240 plus are you know they're not perfect but we've definitely you know this is where i think as as a real estate professional you really learn the negotiation and how to how to work certain things uh, and so we've really worked closely with our tenants and, you know, making sure that they're applying for rent relief or we're doing what we have to as far as, uh, you know, uh, relocation. And I think that's where I get that second question is, can I evict? And the popular one is I have an escrow. There is a tenant in my, es you know, in my escrow who's responsible for relocating them. Um, and the reality is there is no, there's, I mean, it's all, it's all negotiable. Uh, the seller has more leverage. Um, a lot of times what's going to end up happening is this is going to have to, it's going to be done not through actual forms. It's going to be done, well, maybe through a cash for keys, but a lot of times it's going to require some kind of cash for keys negotiation. I don't know if I would be comfortable selling a property to a, a buyer of mine that has tenants in it, because then, you know, that, that tenant's going to move or that buyer's going to have uh, ownership of that property, but they're not going to have possession. And so the way the courts are right now, it could be four to six to eight to 12 months of them paying a mortgage without being able to take possession of that property. And Alex can probably help out here. You know, that certain loans may not look favorable, especially if that's going to be, if they're going to try to claim that as owner occupants. So, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so what's, what's the time frame on that, Alex? Like, for example, if they have a mortgage laid on their credit. Uh, no, as far as like owner occupancy, if they're claiming owner occupancy, but oh, there's the 59 days from when escrow closes, mm -hmm. they got to move into the property within mm -hmm. 59 days. Yeah. And we've all seen the horror stories. We've seen the, the LA Times reports that, you know, tenant buys a prop or a person buys a property and the tenants won't move out. Uh, unfortunately, the tenants right now do have a lot of leverage. And so what I always recommend is that seller or that listing agent need to be, need to get very creative as far as, and they don't want to, right? Cause they're lazy. They just want to like wash their hands and get rid of the property. But it's a huge liability on, on your part if you're representing the buyer and that tenant, that property is going to be tenant occupied. Um, that listing agent needs to really work um, on figuring out some kind of negotiation, some kind of cash for keys. Um, I always recommend that we prepare our sellers that they're going to have to, um, you know, offer some kind of compensation for, for move out. Um, it does happen. We actually have on one of my, one of my actually properties that, that I manage and that now we, we listed, we, it was actually pretty cheap. We gave the equivalent of three months rent, which was less than a thousand dollars. And so we gave them basically three grand to move out. 
they were super happy and it was on a two unit property. So now we can sell it with one of those being owner occupied. But uh, the seller didn't want to do anything. They just wanted to kind of wash their hands and get rid of it. But I said, this is, this is the reality that no one's going to want to buy this property um, the way it is, at least if you want to get, you know, uh, a competitive price, we can sell, we could do a fire sale all day to an investor, but they're not going to pay top market, you know, top dollar for that. Um, any questions on this? Oh, I, I have a quick question. Um, on the chart, you mm -hmm. see at the top left, single family with exception, single family without exception. Yeah. What, what differentiates those? Okay. So single family homes are exempt from rent control. If you serve the notice that they are exempt from rent control. And it's, it's just a document. It's actually a lot of this stuff is in CAR. So that one's called the rent caps uh, and just cause addendum. So all you have to do is serve that notice. And there's a little checkbox that says that this property is exempt from rent control. So that's, that's all it is, is having. And so all the new leases have that kind of built in, uh, but it is a standalone form. Uh, and that, that creates the exception, which a lot of people have not done. A lot of times- What line does Long Beach fall under? Uh, Long Beach would be, <laughs> so- um, He left. Oh, yeah. Long, so Long Beach is kind of, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Long Beach is also kind of a hybrid s situation where they, actually the, right now they are in the process of updating some of their laws. And so they would essentially, so th these are all single families would fall under, you know, single families and condos would fall under the single family with exemption, no exemption. Um, and I think everything else would be, um, actually, I don't know what this would be. Um, so it, it would essentially be two units with the, well, I guess it would depend if it was single family or, or if it's a single family, then it's it's single family with exception, but if it's two units, it would be under, actually, I don't know if it would necessarily, it would follow under one of these similar to the, the bottom one or the like Orange County um, where rent increases are 8.6. And then most other places are kind of, yeah, it follows the same as the Orange County one. And I think that's for most cities, uh, unless they have their own kind of ordinance, then that, that's kind of what it follows. Now, do ADUs fall under being two units? <laughs> why, why you gotta throw that in there? Uh, it, it, it depends, it depends. And so it, it really, and I don't even know if I have an answer for that because everyone is gonna be situational, depends if it's, attached to the main building or if it was like a garage conversion that's detached. So every, gonna, every case is gonna be slightly different. Um, what we have seen that's consistent is that the back unit, since it is um, newer construction, that back unit will be exempt from rent control, but then the single family home now falls under rent control because it's older construction. Mm. Yeah. So if you do build an ADU, make sure, and you know, you're gonna rent out that front house, make sure that front house has um, you know, market rent and make sure that you definitely put in a new lease because that will fall under rent control. Yeah. Wow. All right, I'm gonna move on to the, actually I see it, something in the chat. Oh, okay, just, uh, all right. So the other one I get is 24 hour notices and are they enforceable? And this is another, actually a lot of stuff is, it depends, it depends. And so, you know, again, a lot of this is gonna fall onto the owner and the listing agent and are those tenants cooperative? And if they're all cooperative, then, you know, go for it. Uh, make sure that the listing agent serves a written notice and it's just not verbal because you wanna make sure that, you know, again, that this is, and, but what I mean by written is it's, it's gotta be posted on their door or personally handed to them because um, that will serve as, as an actual legal notice. Under most circumstances, this is, uh, this is a breach in the contract. And so in the past, we were able to evict if a tenant did not give us access to the property. 
that's kind of on hold right now. And so um, a lot of it deals with cooperation. Um, so, you know, that, some of that's going to fall under listing agent. Uh, what we've done for, especially for stuff that's super important, like appraisals and, you know, home inspections and whatnot, we've called the police. And so we'll say, you know, we have a, we have a, we have a property and, um, you know, we're going to need a police escort to go inside. We have a, and so they've actually worked with us, but, you know, police don't necessarily always want to do that. But if it, if it comes down to like, in escrow, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be as resourceful as possible. And so I would, you know, if that's going to, if you think those those tenants are not going to be cooperative, I would contact the, the police department to try to schedule that. And even at that, yeah. though, that's kind of a long shot though, right? Because don't they sometimes just say it's a civil matter? Yeah, yeah, they will. It really depends. A lot of times, you know, it's, I don't think I've had a police officer not at least I'm showing up that, you know, mm -hmm. not necessarily escorting us inside, but if that tenant sees the police, then they'll be like, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, we haven't had a situation where they, we weren't given access uh, after that, but they will. It, it really just depends on the police department. But I mm -hmm. find that if I give them enough notice, they will, they will give us access to the property. But I mean, I would, I would try. If it comes down to that, then, you know, like I said, just be as resourceful as possible. Okay. Um, but those are the, the kind of the main stuff. I could really talk about this all day and I do every day, but is there any other, is there any questions you guys have? I got one, Josue. Um, I have two sets of clients that are looking for duplex um, mm -hmm. and three units. And it just seems to, every time you look at the private, the private remarks, it's always, um, seller is not responsible for you know evicting tenants mm -hmm. great long-term tenants paying you know below market rents you know mm -hmm. and it's just like okay every time i go up to my clients and tell them that they're just like this guy doesn't want to show me the damn house you know what i mean mm -hmm. so what can we do or what type of conversations can we have with the listing agent where we could you know, work on that uh, cash for key scenario. You said you said get creative with the with the listing agent. What type of conversation would you have with them? Well, they're not going to feel the pinch until that uh, until that property is going to not be an escrow for you know essentially 30, 60, 90 days, and then that listing agent's going to be like, "Whoa, okay, we got to we got to do something." So off the bat, that may not work. But I think, you know, and I'm, I don't know, there's possibly people that are willing to buy it the way it is. I don't know if I would recommend someone to do that, if, especially if, um, I mean, I look at everything. I look at the leases, I look at the estoppels, I, you know, I look at the tenant ledgers because we've actually taken over some properties where everything looked good on paper. And then the moment we, we start managing the property, there's two tenants that aren't paying. And so documents were doctored to show mm -hmm. that, <laughs> that everyone was current. But a lot of times, you know, it, it's going to come down to uh, that listing agent and they may not, they may, like I said, they're not going to feel it at, at the very beginning. And that property may need to sit on the market for a little bit and then just following up with that, with that agent and figuring out, you know, what's it going to take. Um, and especially if it's going to be competitive uh, on the price, you may want to try to negotiate, you know, possibly some um include that include that relocation into some kind of consideration on on how the price works right but, uh, yeah listing agents it's they have all the they have all the leverage but until they until that listing is not moving there's no incentive for them to try to negotiate anything right right yeah that's a similar yeah. situation on this one right here um that i was they, it's been on the market for 110 days it was originally listed at a 850 and they just dropped it down to 779 Mm -hmm. so it's like but they're still adamant about keeping the tenants in there you know what right. I mean? so it's like all right yeah yeah i'm gonna guess that the tenants probably aren't paying mm. that's, that's a good possibility i mean that's that's what the common mm -hmm. commonality is with most of these is that people want to yeah. dump them if they were paying mm -hmm. they probably would hold on to it but they're stuck so you know for what this is worth, my two cents, you know, when I ask questions, if I'm dealing with a first time investor who is looking to start their portfolio because they read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I'm all about it. 
But if they've never been down this road and a lot of this conversation of what Josue is sharing with us, it's just over their head. And I'm almost to the point where I will just let them go work with someone else because the education process, there's such a big gap in it that the first time buyer investor doesn't get it. And they're thinking that exactly what you said, Edgar, he doesn't want to show me this property, but there are so many dynamics to eat, like even Long Beach, if th it, there's different rules to the game, depending on where in Long Beach or Compton you're in, whether you can evict them or not, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's just this big kind of open cans of worms and just depending on your time, maybe you want to hold them and be that source for them, or maybe it's not worth your time. The probability of crossing the finish line, I guess is what I'm trying to say is very, it's tough with a newer mm -hmm. investor. Right. And I mean, I also look at the motivation of that seller because, I mean, the reality is most of our sellers don't sell because we do a good job of managing their properties. There's no reason for them to sell. People sell when there's that push point, you know, when there's some kind of reason. Uh, and so maybe it is they're losing money on the collected rents. Possibly they want to move their money out of state or into something bigger. But I find that's more of the exception. And I think it's, you know, definitely asking those, those questions on why, you know, why are they selling? I yeah, can't right. a little late, so I apologize if you already answered this, but I have a client who we're looking at a duplex in Silver Lake, but same thing, the tenants are there and they want to live in the back unit. Is it possible to evict if you're planning on living there or is it just the same thing where we're kind of stuck? You're, so City of LA has probably the most strict rules when it comes to relocation. Um, it's going to cost, it's the real, it's going to be about, well, upwards of 20,000 to relocate that tenant. Um, but they are able to, the question is, you know, do you, do you have that time? Does your buyer have that time to, to kind of, you know, deal with that that time frame of paying a mortgage and having a tenant not potentially move out um so i i, I suggested that a lot of times it's going to fall on the listing agent but uh mm -hmm. because well and and then there's the other part of it is there's the legality so in, in city of la you are able to do that and it fall if the property actually I should always ask a few more leading up questions but if that property falls under what's called rso or the rent stabilization ordinance then they would fall under that twenty thousand um, dollars, but it does allow for owner occupancy. And then, but then the other part is what's really happening. And what's really happening is a lot of the people they don't want to move. They don't want to move, so they don't want to move. You've got to evict them, and the whole eviction process is going to take. Right now, we're seeing six to eight months. Six to eight. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Wow. wow. So. Yeah, it makes for very difficult conversations and uh, a lot of stuff is just pretty heavy. It's hard for me to keep track of it because the laws literally are changing every day. And like I said, Long Beach is right in the middle of trying to update some of their laws. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, you earn your money as, as real estate agents. And so, you know, I, I, if there's a time to really amp your skills and your negotiation, I mean, you're obviously at the right place to do that, but this is where you're going to really learn to negotiate with, with listing agents and with tenants and, you know, with, well, obviously with your sellers, if, if you're the listing agent on one of these uh, multifamily properties. It, it almost sounds like whether you're buying or selling, it's almost sounds like you have to kind of consult an eviction attorney. Because there's, yeah. cause there's no, because I, I get it. I know what you're saying. Like, it depends because there's so many different loopholes. But to really, like, in that scenario, one would have to know all of the legalities behind it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, you know, I'm not sure anyone really does, if, unless you're an eviction attorney who's up on And the it has to be specifically day. an eviction attorney because we get stuff all the time from family law attorneys and all. And right. I, I know more than these people. And so, and even some eviction attorneys that are just, because you really, I mean, you really just got to be, have your finger on the pulse of what's happening. And so if you do consult them, you know, even CAR sometimes, because CAR, they know what's happening at the state level, 
but they don't know the dynamics of what's happening in LA City or in, un, uh, in the unincorporated areas. So it's really understanding, you know, what, what is happening in that specific city. Yeah. You know, I'll just leave you guys with this. I really think that you just need to ask these questions to the listing agent because their clients have probably gone down the eviction attorney route and there's no definitive answer to their problem. It's always about, well, you will have to evict and that could take anywhere from six to eight months. Could take. So it's again, it may go longer. I mean, I've been in this experience uh, back in 2008 it took me 24 months to get a tenant out of Pasadena with $24,000 in legal fees later. I did get them out, but it wasn't six to eight months. It was 24 months. And because like Josue started out, there were groups and there were communities that are bound, binding together and they are getting legal support from one of those members. So in my situation, the squatter who was living in my property was the ringleader of the mortgage meltdown who felt he was defrauded, who wanted to sue Bank of America, Wells Fargo. And he was a hundred community deep and growing very fast. So every time we would file a motion or an eviction or something, he was getting free counsel to exactly what Josue get, get him thrown out of court. And they did that for repeatedly over and over and over until the judge finally said, there's been six motions filed. We're, we're going we're gonna to hear this case. Mm -hmm. But that took us two years and we did end up winning. But that's the problem is like you just, there is no clear path to what we're looking to do here. It's just kind of like, you have to go down the legal path. You got to go down the legal and let it, let it run its course. Yeah. And not all buyers have that capacity to carry that financial burden six nope. months or 12 months or 24 months yeah. and so that's the risk that you you take when when a property is going to be vacant or when it's not going to be vacant in hindsight of course i would have not bought it i would have not bought it so again just buyer beware if you guys are representing buyers there are a lot of moving parts to this um, again, if we, you know, Josue, I'm sure has a good eviction attorney. We use Bruce Mankey in Long Beach, uh, credible guy and, and just cross your T's and dot your I's, but, um, to move your buyers in there and evict a tenant to take owner occupancy, to take advantage of FHA or whatever the rate might be is it's in uh, on paper. It sounds doable, but if the deadbeat doesn't want to move, it's going to be a tough one to get them out. Yeah. So, all right. Any other questions for Josue? Would Sorry to be such a downer. But, uh. Would you want to <laughs> consult if that kind of listing comes your way as well? I'm sorry. Can you repeat it, Monica? If that kind of listing comes your way, would you want to consult an attorney as well as far as how you can advertise it or how you can explain the process to potential buyers? I would. I mean... For, for, for a lot of situations, and again, we, you know, we've made decision to get an attorney on, on retainer. So we have at least, at the very least, weekly conversations with our, uh, with our property owners in regards to the, the specifics. Uh, and this way also, you're not quoting everything because again, liability rise, risk management wise, you do not want to be giving legal advice, right? And so uh, this, again, disclaimer, I'm not an attorney, I'm just sharing some of my knowledge. But for legal stuff, I don't try to answer anything. I definitely bring my attorney involved and you know, let them walk that path with, uh, with, that, with that property owner and say, you know, for uh, risk management, you don't, they, they, they're the ones that should know kind of the ins and outs of what's happening. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Well, cool, man. Uh, appreciate your time. Yeah. Uh, feel no, free absolutely. to hang out if you can, or if you're busy and, or I know you're busy, you know, um, obviously, um, you can move on, but thanks. Thanks for the two cents. And again, guys, if you have clients who are looking for property management services, Josue is a great resource for you. Um, and let him deal with all of these, this noise <laughs> and non, non paying tenants and such. So, yeah, no, I appreciate it. And we, you know, we've had a great relationship with, with you guys. And uh, I do want to say that we do have a no compete. 
So feel free and, and have the confidence in knowing that you can pass us clients, we'll manage the property. And so if it does come down and there's a conversation where they're asking if they should sell, it does go back to that agent that referred it to us. We're not, we're not stealing your business. So we want to grow together because most likely they're going to buy something bigger and then we'll get to manage that together. So uh, yeah, we work more, together. We build more together, doors. We grow together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. But yeah, cool. I, I'm going to, I am going to step out, but great to see you guys. I do want to see you guys in person, hopefully soon. And, uh, but yeah, keep, keep kicking butt. Thank you. Josue. Thanks, man. See you guys. Thanks. Well, Stacey and Edgar, uh, hopefully that kind of answers your questions. Um, it's going to be tough. It's mm -hmm. going to be tough. And you got to figure the sellers have explored all those options already. And now they're just trying to see if they can pass the problem on to the next buyer and inherit their, their challenges. Um, so... Okay, well, real quick, we got a couple minutes left. I wanted to uh, kind of jump over and talk a little bit about tech. It's great because now that we're, I'm getting to meet with most of you, um, every other week you guys are poking holes and bringing up things that um, you know we either need to uh, close the gaps on or fix um, or educate. So I wanted to talk about QR codes and what you know what QR codes made a push probably about eight years ago, but never really took off. And now with the pandemic and everything, it's obviously forced and leveled up um, things that would have eventually come in time. Uh, but as you saw during the pandemic, restaurants, QR codes, you just shoot the QR code on the table and boom, there's the menu, right? And so that prompted a lot of ideas. And now you're seeing QR codes over different, many different platforms and different industries for services. So it's basically just taking your camera and, and holding it over that QR code, which is redirecting it to some landing page. So when you put your camera over it, you just hit the button and it takes you to where they want to take you, uh, whether it's a menu at a restaurant or whatnot. So some of the other back um, things that we've been leveraging it for, Dennis has been using it for uh, on every postcard that goes out and it takes them back to where does it take them on your, you're promoting your YouTube channel. Yeah. So I was able to do two, one that takes them to, um, through core fact to see their property value. And then a second one to go to our YouTube channel because I'm farming the neighborhood and the YouTube channel is aimed towards the neighborhood. Yeah. So that that's an example. So, you know, Nika, did we want to show them Nika who we're using? Mm -hmm. yep. Would that be okay? Yeah. Maybe I could pass it to you and you could just share your screen and um, I can help you and talk about what we're leveraging QR codes for and see if that gives anybody else any ideas um, for mm -hmm. their own business. Okay, um, I'll share my screen. Um, can you see my screen now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so for... Um, Kato Group, we're currently using Flow Code. It's a it's the QR gen QR code generator that Scott suggested. So I'll show um I'll show which uh of the marketing materials did we use the QR codes for. So um we have this um lifestyle magazine that is being uh distributed to um a mailing list and then I created just a quick um, graphic uh, that will show the QR code for the home, eva home valuation um, page for Kato Group. So, um, so I created a QR code using the flow, flow code and then I just pasted it to, an, to a graphic. And then once this magazine is printed and mailed out, um, they can just easily scan and then it will direct them to the home valuation page. So another... Um, uh, avenue that we use is for the newsletters. So monthly, we create newsletters for Kato Group. And then I also created, like, I just repurposed the QR code from this one. And then I created another graphic, which shows them a quick overview of what they will be able to see once they sign up for the um, home, uh, home bot um, subscription. So, and then 
again, repurposing the content, we also uploaded a an Instagram post, um, basically just showing them um what what the benefit they can get when they install uh when they um subscribe to our home button. And then um, another thing that you can use it for is for your for sale signs. So what's great with flow code or the one that we're using is that QR codes has two different types, which is a static and dynamic codes. When you say um, static, um, it's basically once you've set the link for this QR code, that that's permanently the link that it will direct to. But since but for dynamic, you can just even if it's already published or printed, you can easily just um, swap the links so you don't have to create uh, new links again and again. So th that's very useful when you're um, printing out for sale signs. Um, and then also... You can, can, I, can, I, can I just touch on that, okay. Nika, real quick? So, so, you know, obviously, what is the bed? What is the bath? How much are we selling it for? Maybe you don't want to put the price in. It's up to you. But obviously, this QR code here will go to your... To your website where your listing lies which then they can either schedule an appointment with you call you directly you know figure out everything about the house that they would want to know including pictures you can mm -hmm. do that for first for open house signs too and so mm -hmm. for dynamic what you know you can go ahead and interchange that because you're obviously not going to change the qr code on your signs i mean that's done but what mm -hmm. you can do is go into the back side and for every new listing you get you can redirect that qr code to your new listing and then the consumers can get whatever they want. And typically, mm -hmm. when they scan it, do you do you capture inf information, Nika? Yep. Um. So I'll tour the features of Flow Code in a bit. But then it also shows the analytics on how many scans. And then um, you can also upgrade to Pro. So this is a paid um, um QR code generator. Uh, and then once you go to analytics, it will show you um how many people have scanned your uh qr codes so um going back you can also put your qr codes to your business cards so this is definitely a great way to um be more techy <laughs> um in the real estate industry so um you can link your uh website here and then once you give gave away your business cards they can just easily scan then it will again, link them to your uh, website. Um, so going back to the flow code, so there's lots of different um, QR code generators um, online. And we also have free versions um, that you can, um, you can find, but then we suggest using flow code because um, there's really great features and um, I believe uh, their features are more optimized for real estate marketing. So um, these are the um, different uh, marketing materials that you can use the QR codes for. So what we've tapped on is having it printed on your yard signs. So like this one. And then you can also use it for open houses when you want to collect contact information instead of um, having them fill out um, physical forms. This, you can use this um, instead. So it can, it can direct to your um, database or um, CRM. And then uh, this one, another option that we've discussed is the for sale signs. So aside... Um, what Scott has mentioned, you can also link your, like if your listing has a virtual tour, you can also link that to this QR code and then it will automatically um, direct them, direct the clients to that um, virtual tour. And then, so here's the flow code site. So there are two main features, which is the flow codes and flow pages. So I'll discuss the flow pages in a bit also. So this is the code overview. So you, I'll sample how to create a QR code. So it's just really um, a quick process. So right now we're um, just on using the free version because we haven't really printed out a bunch of QR codes yet, but we're planning to um, really integrate them to more marketing materials. So when you create a, Q, uh, your, uh, flow code, you can just name your flow code like um, 
circle listing or new listing. Uh, we'll try to sample that. And then um, there's different uh, types of links that you can choose from, either a file for or a YouTube um, link or video. And then there's also some of the socials. So for now, we'll use the link. And then I have here a current listing under circle. So if you if you want to show the virtual tour, um, you can just click this one. So this is the link for the virtual tour. You'll just copy that and then paste it here. And then you can also um, change the design and colors uh, depending on your branding. And then you can also add your logo like this here. Um, I'll add the Kato Group logo for what? Um, so it'll, this is what your QR code will look like. And then you can just easily create and download the flow code. So um, um, when you scan this, uh, this code, it will direct you to this virtual tour. So that's really just how the process is. And again, you can... There's also some options that you can add it to some templates like this. So if you want to add it to business cards, flyers, posters, and then um, also some other um, templates that you can choose from. But then um, you can also just download it as its own. And then you can just um, paste it to your existing designs. Yep. And then... Quick note on the flow pages. I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, the links that you see on your social bios. Like for this one, in Kato Group, we use Linktree. Um, but then Flow Code also has this great feature that you can use um, a flow page. So like, for example, um, I think I created one. For, uh, Would that be instead of Linktree? Yeah, uh, instead of having two different um, sites, you can also create your flow page here. So like, for example, you, you'll, you, you'll use circle RE and then you'll just want to add the link, add your logo. Um, I'll just sample real quick. <laughs> like You're this so one organized. here. <laughs> so... Um, you'll just add your um, realtor name. And then you can just easily cre create a new link. So a standard link, let's say it will go to the um, Circle Agents website. So um, get to know us. So you'll just save the link and this is how it will show up. So you can also click, uh, cre create a contact collection form. So you'll just um, click on the details that you want to include. And then again, save link. So you can also um, choose the design here. And then this is the analytics for the flow page. So when you publish, this is how it will look like. And then you'll just um, copy your link and then you'll add it to your Instagram bio. Yeah, so after all those features, you'll want to know the pricing, what the pricing is, right? So this is the pricing for the monthly pro and the features that comes with it. But um, you can easily um, create QR codes just using the free or trial version instead. Um, but then um, I also have some links for free QR code generators. Uh, I can send them um, in Slack. So I think that's about it. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you, Nico. Thanks, Nico. Any questions on that, guys? Hey, Scott. So is this going to replace like physical flyers for you guys at open houses and whatnot? Or are you still going to have like a flyer brochure out on your open house sign? I mean, on your first sale sign. Yeah, probably. Uh, it's a great question. 
I'm, I'm inclined to say yes, because I want them to scan it to give them what they want, but then I get what I want, mm -hmm. which is their information. So my QR code, I imagine, will go right into follow up boss. So meaning they got to put in some information first, which is their sign in. That's their or, sign in, yeah. Or I'll ask Nika if it can auto grab it automatically. Yeah, that's what I was thinking because you know. I just wonder how many people will just exit out once they see the information being grabbed. I wonder if there's a way for, you know, because everybody's phone, everybody's information is tied to their phone. So I wonder if there's a, if there's a way to just bypass pull that info. Yeah. 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 That's the goal. Yeah. So, and then also another good one is, uh, again, it's just really home evaluations. We're going to start using it for testimonials, just something different, maybe you might get a different response, right? So it's just about putting enough lines in the water and some fish like this bait, some fish like that bait. And so we just want to make sure that we have exposure for whatever kind you want it, you know, a link, a picture, whatever, it's going to take them to the same spot. And hopefully we'll still get the same information we're looking for. So, okay, terrific. Any closing thoughts? Thank you, Nika, again. That was awesome, very helpful. Any closing thoughts out there? Any questions? All right, stay, stay engaged on Slack. We're going to kick off an office meeting um, within the next 10 days. Uh, so we'll do more tech again. Um, we'll, we'll office hours are Mondays. You know, we've been doing office hours Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. A little bit, a couple of you have been jumping in and out, but we're going to do it on Mondays until that gets busy or there's demand for more. Then we'll open it up again and go Wednesday, Friday or something. But right now, if you have any technical questions, office hours from 12 to 1, Michelle, myself, we'll start uh, promoting in advance. Maybe it's going to be Monica with CISU or Nika with QR codes or hi, you know, um, Linktree or whatever piece of tech that we need or marketing piece, I'm sorry, marketing we need. And then just give us feedback too on what you guys would like to see, like today, guest speaker um, for, you know, for Edgar and Stace, whatever is coming up. And if we don't have the resources here, we'll try to grab someone from the outside world to join us. Um, and then uh, survey, Michelle's gonna send out a survey to you guys shortly. Again, we just want feedback, what were, went well with the onboarding, what was kind of clunky, what was kind of broken. We're still in the transition of, you know, we're looking for a, a, a system that will, it'll be more like a game level where you have to do X, Y, and Z and then complete it. And then it'll take you on to level two. And then once we get headshots, this, this, and this, then it'll let you go on to level three. Cause right now it's just like this shotgun approach where you guys have headshots, logos, and some are on Slack, some are over here. We want to kind of obviously hone in on that to give it a better experience for those that are joining us. So your feedback is crucial in helping us do that. Um, so be on the lookout for that as well. Okay. Business cards, uh, Danny, yours will get in the mail today. All of you others, they're at the office, Dennis, Christina, um, Amy, they're all at the office. Those that haven't put in their business card, it's usually because we're waiting for either a rebranding of your logo or we're waiting on your headshot. Um, so we're working on some photographer to come in once a month to help shoot headshots for us. So that's kind of in the works, but for now, if you are wanting to, um, update your headshot, go get it and then bring it back. And then Nika will help curate your business cards. And the first, uh, 50 from Mu are on, on us on circle real estate. So, um, when you're ready, let us know. All right. Okay. Unless anyone's got any questions, it's past 11. Sorry to keep it, keep you on, but uh, hopefully that was a value. And uh, I'll see you guys on Slack. I did want to say one last thing. If you guys have any lending questions, I am at Slack. Feel free to reach out. I know Danny reached out last week. Uh, so like I mentioned, any questions, concern about lending, I'm always here to help. Appreciate that, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right, guys, we're here to support you. Let us know how we can help. Have a great Thank week, you. everyone. Have a good one.
Take care. See you guys.